Lord, let's go ahead and take a seat. We have with us this hour, Travis Walker. Currently lives in Midland, Texas and preaches for the Billy Hext Road uh, Church in Odessa. Uh, Travis comes from the Pacific Northwest, was born in Oregon and uh, grew up on the West Coast. So there's some shared uh, experience there. And uh, we have some interesting uh, correlations because uh, I followed his father to Clovis, California. And then he came to Clovis, California a few years after I had left there and come here. And uh, both my father and his father worked in the Fresno and Clovis area. So there's a lot of uh, intersection there. But uh, he is now in uh, a, a Texas walker. So he and his wife uh, have uh, three children. Sarah and uh, Andrew, and then Jordan is a, is a student here uh, currently. So we're happy to have his family here, and we're happy that Jordan is here uh, as well. And we're happy that Travis is here to share with us uh, his lecture. So give him your attention, please. Good morning. Before we begin, I just want to express my appreciation. I don't know if it's appreciation or not, but it's appreciation for the Bible department to invite me to come and to, to speak. Uh, people say, oh, such an honor. Like, I don't know. <laughs> because they made me write something and I'm not a writer, not at all. But I do appreciate the opportunity to to come and talk to you about some things from God's word. I also want to express my appreciation for the speakers this week. Uh, the lessons that they have prepared have been encouraging. Uh, they have been admonishing in a lot of ways. And, and so I find great benefit in that. And I pray for all those speakers and the other preachers and servants in the kingdom and the audience that God continues to bless the work that we do for his glory and for his honor. And ultimately, I want to thank God for this opportunity. When I started preaching, I, I made kind of a habit of, when I, before I get up and preach, I would go to James chapter 3 and verse 1 and read, or think about, recite, meditate that, that scripture. Let not many of you be teachers, knowing that you shall receive the stricter condemnation. And that's a good exercise to pursue as I've gotten older and been doing this a little bit longer there's other passages that come to my mind come to my thinking in second Corinthians chapter 4 Paul says we have this treasure in vessels of clay it is so remarkable and so awesome that our creator God has given us feeble fragile and fallible individuals the opportunity to express the most wondrous treasure in this world and that's Jesus Christ and so we stand before him because ultimately no matter how many people are here or wherever you're at we serve we speak we live with an audience of one it's all about Jesus Christ and serving him Joseph Addison said, a contented mind is the greatest blessing a man can enjoy in this world. This morning, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the peace of God that surpasses understanding, a contentment that is worthy of the gospel. I think this is an important exercise because we as humans have the tendency to more easily identify with things that are negative, whether it be information or experiences. We have the tendency to give more importance or more weight to those things that are negative. And we have the tendency to internalize and remember and dwell on the things that are negative. 
long time ago when I first started, I did a summer internship up with, in Maryland, and, and it was very encouraging work up in that, that congregation. But I remember to this day a card that a woman in that congregation gave me. I don't remember who it was, but I remember this. So this was back in 1993, double-breasted suits were the popular thing. I had them, I wore them, I never buttoned them. She says, you know, you're doing a really good job as a young preacher. I appreciate that, but make sure to button your coat. <laughs> and to this day, those words stick in my mind. Now, I wear single-breasted, so I don't have to do that anymore. But I think that illustrates what we know so well. I mean, think about it. What's easier for you to recall and think about compliments or for you to recall and think about insults? Well, what's easier for you to dwell on things that were unpleasant or for those things that were pleasant? I say all of this because what I have noticed over the past several years, if we have experienced some tumultuous times with pandemic and all those kinds of things, I have noticed that complaints tend to abound. We complain about everything. We complain about the economy. Every time you go and buy a dozen eggs, now what are you hearing is how expensive they are. You go to the gas pump and you put gas in your car and you complain about the price of gas. By the way, I just recently learned something living where I live and that is when you guys pay more for gas, it's better for my community. <laughs> because I live in the Permian Basin. But that's how it kind of is. But we also complain about politics. I mean, Terry did a great job on this the other night. I appreciate his lecture on being citizens of heaven first and foremost. But we complain about politics. We complain about policy. We complain about parties. We talk about morality. And I think there's a lot that we could say about morality and where we are as a nation, as a people, as a global community. But I want to set that aside for a minute. Because what I want us to see to start out is that while there's a lot of negative, we live in an amazing place. As Doy said, I grew up West Coast, left coast, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but there's something amazing about seeing the grandeur of Mount Hood and living in the Willamette Valley. And then being down in the central part of California to stand before and stand in the shadow of a giant sequoia and you see the handprint of God. Or to stand by the Pacific Ocean and hear the crashing of the waves or stand at the base of Bridal Veil Falls in Yosemite Valley and hear that water as it comes roaring down. There's something amazing about the earth that we live. But we also live in an amazing time my great-grandfather was born in 1901. I got to be with him until he passed away in the early 90s. And I often recall, what is it that he would think about concerning his experiences from 1901 to the early 90s? There's quite a bit of things that happened during that time. And we've experienced this as well. I mean, think about transportation. I mean, we all came here, if you're not from Florida, from other places, you probably came here either in a plane or in a car. You didn't come here in wagon or horseback. And you got here within hours. We look at the advancements in exploration and we see pictures of distant reaches of our universe and our solar system. 
and they're awe-inspiring, and yet at the same time, we have looked at some of the smallest elements of our universe, things that our eyes can't see and see their complexity. Talking about communication, what's happened over the past 10 years or so with communication. Our lives are all about communication now. I mean, when we entered into pandemic, what was the question? It's like, how do we communicate with each other when we can't be with each other? And so we depended on those advancements. You think of medicine and what has happened in medicine? Cures have been discovered for diseases that once debilitated and destroyed lives. And today they're almost non-existent, those diseases. And yet with all of that, with all the ways that we can enjoy where we are, the reality is personal happiness and personal peace and contentment are declining. There was an article in 2019. This is less than a year before pandemic. And the opening sentence in that article was, life in America keeps getting more miserable. I was like, just wait eight months and you'll see really how bad it would get. <laughs> but that's how people are. Now, maybe you don't feel that way. And if you don't, and rather, I mean, what we talked about in our earlier uh, session this morning, that because the way that you're living, you're experiencing joy, if that's where you are, great. But the reality is that many in Christ struggle every day. They live without happiness. They live without joy, they live without peace, they live without contentment. Why is that? It's not just because we have this negativity bias. I think our world has created a pressure and that pressure convinces us that if we want purpose, if we want significance, if we want personal value, it's wrapped up in the accumulation of power, of prosperity, of popularity, and prowess. And what that accumulation does really is, is it accelerates anxiousness and discontent and emptiness. Imagine the person who's stranded in a life raft, at, life raft at sea under the beating rays and heat of the sun thinking about quenching thirst in that body of blue. Why doesn't he just dip into that water and get a drink? Because the reality is that salt water doesn't quench thirst, salt water creates thirst. And that's what we've done in this life. We drink from the things of the world and what it has done is it has left us empty and wanting something else, seeking something else. Isn't that what the preacher says in Ecclesiastes? In chapter one, what's he conclude? He says it's vanity. It's all empty. It doesn't do anything for us because worldly pursuits do not last. They have a shelf life, unlike Twinkies. <laughs> they have a shelf life. But see, as followers of Christ, we're called to a different kind of life, a better life, a life that Paul says in chapter 1, 27, Philippians, is worthy of the gospel. And when that life becomes the goal of our life, then we will find in life joy and peace and contentment. Not in the acquisition of things. It's not going to be in how much I have. And it's not going to be, well, really, I want to change my circumstances. It's not going to be in that at all. 
but rather it's found in the person of Christ and in the perspective he provides. Why is this important? In Philippians chapter 2, what does Paul say? Do not grumble. Do not complain or dispute that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked generation among whom you what? You shine as lice. That's why this is important. If we live with the wrong perspective, the world sees it. If we live with the right perspective, they see Jesus. That's why it's important. So maybe you're struggling with circumstances in your life, whatever they are. I want us to realize that God can take those circumstances and use them to mold us, to mature us, to be more like the master. Maybe you're anxious about things in this life, things that God has promised that he would provide. What's Jesus say in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Maybe we're just too focused on the terrestrial and not enough on the celestial. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Now, the concept of contentment is not isolated to the Macedonian epistles. In fact, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews 13 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12, aspire to live quietly and to mind your own Affairs. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and in verse 11 and in verse 12, it says to do their work quietly. There's an attitude that we are to adopt. And this attitude is one that we see very clearly in the Apostle Paul, specifically in Philippians chapter 4. Let's read Philippians chapter 4 in just a few verses, verse 9 through verse 12. In verse 9, Paul says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, revived your concern for me. You indeed, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned, get this, the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What's remarkable about this passage is it's not just words to Paul. He's not just encouraging these Christians. He is exhibiting to these Christians that attitude that he's calling them to. And of course, we have to look and understand as Paul is penning this epistle, that the reality of his circumstances are from the external perception, very negative. We often talk about Paul being in Roman imprisonment, and yes, he was. But remember the things that preceded that? Because as he's writing Philippians, he's towards the end of that imprisonment. Preceding that is he was stranded on an island. He was shipwrecked. He was in Caesarea through the change of Felix and Festus. And then he was also in Jerusalem, and he was facing arguing crowds, and that's why he was arrested in the first place. He's facing all these things in the period of time. It's not just a short period of time. It's probably what I, I have seen people say is at least two years of a process. And yet throughout all of that, he is still saying things that I have found the secret. See, his circumstances do not take away from the joy he has in his heart and the peace and contentment he has in his thinking. So the question for us that's before us is how do we adopt that perspective? 
And yes, it is a fruit, and we'll see it is the fruit that comes from some other things. But through the process, we adopt that and we change our life's perception. Before we get into that, I want to just talk about two words to key in on. First word is content. What is the word content? There are several words that are used for the word content. This one is used in verse 11 is unique. It's the idea of self-sufficient, but not independent, like we would think. It is myself is sufficient in this situation. I'm okay. I don't need more. I don't need less. I'm being strengthened. That's kind of the idea behind it. But then whether you look in English or Greek translation, Greek dictionaries and things like that, there is a word that I saw pop up often, and that's the word satisfaction. I know some people saying I can't get no satisfaction. I get that. <laughs> but what are we satisfied with? For the child of God, it's more than just satisfaction with who we are. And it's more than just satisfaction with what we have and with our circumstances in life. I would suggest to you, our satisfaction is knowing God's person. What's James saying? James chapter 1 and verse 17. That he is the father of lights with whom there is no variation. He doesn't change. He is always the almighty creator and father. But it's also about knowing God's power and his position. I like the psalmist, Psalm 115, verse 3. He says, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He's in control. And it's also knowing that God's promises are unfailing and unchanging. Because he never lies. I do think we need to exercise some caution when we talk about contentment and talk about contentment from the negative perspective of what is not contentment. See, contentment is not the absence of desire. I think we have to be careful with that. What we read in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21 is that, the, that while we might have hopes and that we might have desires and we might have plans, we have to always be cognizant that it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Amen. Paul in chapter 2 and verse 19 and verse 23 says, I desire to send Timothy to Philippi. He had a desire. He wanted to do something. And in fact, in verse 24, he says it was his desire to go to Philippi. So being content doesn't mean that we don't have desires or wants or some things that we want. Secondly, contentment does not result in complacency. I think sometimes it's possible, conceivable, that someone might say, you know what? I've been walking with Christ a long time and where I'm at, my spiritual maturity is good. I'm content with where I'm at. That's not contentment. That's complacency. See, Paul's prayer for the saints of Philippi in chapter 1 and verse 9 was that their love that they presently had would what? Abound more and more, that it would continue to grow. Paul understood that while he desired, there's desire again, chapter 1 verse 23, to be with Christ, for him to remain would be for the progress, movement, growth of the Philippians. The second word to key in in chapter 4 and verse 11 and verse 12 is the word learned. See, contentment is not the default attitude of humanity. We go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and what we discover is that God told Adam and Eve, you could eat of any tree in the garden except one. But what is it Adam and Eve does? They seek out that one. Why? Because they were discontent with what God had provided and they were dissatisfied with where they were in position relative to God. Because what Satan say? He says, when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. They were discontent with where they were. Do we realize that discontent 
like pride, is in the heart of every temptation to sin. I'm not happy with what God says. I'm not happy with where I'm at. Therefore, I'm going to expand my thinking, my actions, and go beyond what he says. But while it might not be naturally present, Paul reminds us that it's an outlet, outlook that can be learned. He says, I have learned the secret. That's what we want, to learn the secret. And when we learn that secret, what we learn is, as Daniel said earlier, joy is a result, contentment is a result. It's a result of other things. Well, what things? Daniel and I are kind of overlapping just a little bit. I love the, the invitation says, okay, this is your assigned topic. And why I was assigned contentment, I don't know. I have my own reasons in my thinking. But as I look at contentment, really contentment and joy are extensions of each other. They work hand in hand with each other. And so as I was going through Philippians, I keyed in on those joy statements because what Paul says surrounding those joy statements awfully reflects his mentality of peace and contentment in his situation. So what we find in chapter 1 verse 18 of Philippians when he says, what then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. See, contentment is the result of a focused life. When God's purpose becomes our priority, then we will find contentment. I want to spend more time here than on the others and and ask the question, well, what's God's purpose? Well, Paul says one of those purposes there in verse 18. In fact, he goes all the way back to verse 12 and he talks about this and that is the advancement of the gospel. That's God's purpose. In verse 12, while Paul is talking about his circumstances, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now think about that. He says, here I am. And he could say, my life's not really that great right now. But he says, really what I see in this is that there is a positive benefit, that the message of God's love and his mercy and his grace in Jesus Christ is able to be communicated to others. And notice to who? In verse 12 and verse 13, verse 13 he says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He says, because I'm here and not there, other people that I might not have the opportunity to speak to can hear about Jesus Christ. He says, that is not an obstacle. It's an opportunity. Is that how we view our obstacles? As opportunities to communicate the message of the gospel further to those that are lost or to communicate the message of the gospel in order to encourage those that are saved and are in need of encouragement. What's Paul saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 1? We comfort those with the comfort that God has given us. Where Paul was, he says, I use that to help other people to bring them to Christ and strengthen them in Christ. In verse 14, Paul says, because of his circumstances, most of the brethren became more confident and bolder to speak the word without fear. How did that happen? Because the brethren saw Paul's relationship with Christ and they saw his current circumstances and they saw the fact that he was not unshaken, that he was not unmoved in his faith and it had an impact. See, what Paul pens is not disconnected from his perspective or his practice. It's a reflection of his faith. 
So we read passages like 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. In verse 57, 58 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my blood brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Have we stopped to consider that that's not just words? Paul's looking back on his life and he's looking at the things that he has endured. And he says, I could have been moved, but I wasn't. I could have been shaken, I wasn't. Why? Because I realize that there's benefit in doing this work. Back in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 15 to verse 18, Paul talks about the circumstances of his imprisonment and, and one of the reasons why he was able to rejoice in that circumstance was, now this is odd, he says some priests are from position of goodwill, and some from envy, some from rivalry, some from selfish ambition and desire to afflict Paul. But Paul's response is not bitterness, it's not anger, it's not resentment. How does he respond? Christ is proclaimed. That's what it's about. That's the goal. See, when God's purpose becomes our priority, then no matter the circumstances, we will have peace. And his first purpose is the proclamation of the gospel. Second purpose is his, uh, that we are to appreciate unity. Again, in chapter 1 and verse 18, notice, at the very end of that, he says, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Notice how he's content in his circumstance. Why? Because he recognizes that his audience has been expressing their love for him and their desire for him to our Heavenly Father. Paul says, I have a family that's outside of my circumstance right now that's praying for me through my circumstance. And he took a lot in that. In fact, really the book of Philippians has several statements about relationship. In chapter two, we are to have the mind of Christ and dwell in unity. You go to chapter 4, and verse 2 and verse 3, he encourages Yodia and Satyaki to work out their differences. Why? Because conflict that is unresolved is conflict that promotes anxiety and discontent. It affects our relationship with God, doesn't it? But not only that, it affects our relationship that's damaged. If someone has done something to you and it has not been dealt with or handled scripturally and so it's still hanging over you, maybe you're the, the party that's been offended. How do you perceive that individual? You ever find yourself saying, oh, I know exactly why they did that. It's because of this. And so every action is viewed through the prism of what was unforgiven or undealt with. It affects our relationship with others. How many times does someone who is not happy with their boss takes it out on their wife? When they're not happy with their wife, they take it out on their children. It affects all relationships. It affects the relationship with ourselves. See, unresolved conflict, it creates life without peace. And so Paul says, I appreciate the relationship that we have. And, and if there's any issue in that relationship, we need to serve one another and we need to work it out because that's going to affect how we live and people's perception of Jesus Christ. The third thing that Paul says concerning God's purpose, his priority is knowing Christ. Again, in chapter 3, in verse 1, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me, and it is safe for you. Again, he says, rejoice. Well, why? And then verse 3 through verse 11, he starts talking about those that have confidence or seek to have confidence for salvation in their flesh. Those that mutilate the flesh, the circumcision. And what Paul does is says, okay, let, let, let's, let's have a contest here. If we're going to talk about who has confidence based on the flesh, let, let's really see. And so he details all the things that he had going for him pre-Christ. 
But then you go down to verse 7. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For I have suffered, he says, the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul goes on to say, he says, I gladly gave up those things and I'm fine with it. Why? Because I want to know Christ. Verse 10. I want to know who he is. I want to be able to have that relationship with him. He also goes on in verse 10. He says, I also want to be identified with Christ. I want people when they see me to see Christ. I want to walk after the steps of my Savior. And then verse 11, he says, I want to be received by Christ. And I think this is one of the most interesting ironies of this. That when the child of God is able to be content and at peace in this life, the reality is we become very discontent with this life. What's Paul saying in Philippians 1, 21 through 23? For to me to live is Christ, but to die, that's gain. He says, I'm hard pressed between the two. I want to be with Christ. Here he is and he's looking at his life and says, yeah, I can handle all these things because of Jesus Christ. But then he says, really, I don't want to be here because that's so much better. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12 through verse 14, I strive, I press forward towards that goal. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1, in this tent we groan, longing for something else, to put off this tent. I'm going to run out of time really quickly. So the, the next two points, I'll just kind of breeze through real quick, and that is we find contentment in maturity. And again, this goes back to chapter 3 and at verse 1 in this section with those that mutilated the fe flesh felt that their righteousness was dependent on their physical body and the mutilation of the flesh, flesh the circumcision. And he goes on and he says that there are some that live for self, that they, their God is their belly, they glory in their shame, that they live with mindset on earthly things. And what we find in scripture, especially in the book of Ecclesiastes, is that all these things are unfulfilling. They do not provide substance that will sustain us in this life. I mean, every time the preacher asks the question, he comes to the conclusion, this is vanity, this is empty, this is striving after the wind. But the older preacher, and I think he is older, Solomon, when he looks back in chapter 12, what's he say? That the end of all, I mean, the, the, if we really want to summarize where we find who we are and how we live this life, he says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. In other words, he found his purpose and his perspective in pursuing as he grew maturity-wise that it was in the Prince of Peace, not in the things of the world. In chapter 4 and verse 10, we think we can see again the idea of joy and that contentment is found in a life that is thankful. A heart that is at peace is a heart that is grateful. And you look at that passage there, which we read earlier, when Paul talks about his joy, he, he states it and then he turns around and he starts talking about the things that the brethren had done for him. He says, I'm content, but I want you to know I'm thankful for what you've done. I'm thankful for that. In the midst of those circumstances, the brethren of Philippi were concerned for Paul's well-being. They were concerned about him physically. They were concerned about him emotionally. That's what we see in chapter 4 and verse 10. Earlier in the book, they were so concerned about him, they sent Epaphroditus to minister to his need. In chapter 4 and verse 14 through 18, they provided physical, financial support for him. Why is this significant? 
Because often we can find ourselves saying, you know, when this happens, then I will be grateful. When this happens, then I will be at peace. And those are expressions of dissatisfaction with the provision and disbelief in the goodness of God. It is essential that we take time and think about the blessings that we have received and express appreciation for that. And when we do, what we find is that the things that we may not have and the circumstances that we may want to change really become insignificant because we're focused on the goodness and the grace of God. There's one more statement of joy I want to point out, and that's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. We know this, rejoice in the Lord. I look at that and I ask, what about the Lord do we rejoice in? In verse 4, I think we can rejoice in our relationship with him, that he is my Lord. I'm a sinner. And the God of eternity redeemed me by the blood of his son. I get to serve the king of creation, the king of the church, the king of the cosmos. But not only do I get to rejoice in the relationship that I have with him, I get to rejoice that he's with me. Verse 5 and verse 6. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. That's what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 13 verse 5 that we reference in part. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content for what, with what you have. For he has said, what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I can be content where I'm at because he is always with me. And I can rejoice in his promise. That's what he gives us again in verse 16. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Why? Because God seeks to know and seeks to aid. He provides for me physically. He provides for me emotionally. And he provides for me spiritually, doesn't he? Colossians 1 that through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by what? His blood. If you get nothing out of this morning, I understand. <laughs> I'm a vessel of clay. Get this. Ultimately, I can be at peace today because I'm at peace with whatever happens tomorrow. Amen. I'm at peace with tomorrow, whether it be life or death, because by the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm able to be at peace with God. So what Paul says, to really to summarize everything, in Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Thank you.